Great to see everybody today, and it's so beautiful today. So nice. Last Sunday was gorgeous, and it is this day as well. So grateful for that. We uh, had a lot going on in our church family in the last few days. Um, Jonathan and Jennifer, we uh, share in your loss. I know that. I know that you knew it was coming, but we're never really ready for that. But I'm grateful for her life. I heard lots of good things about her. A wonderful lady. So we share in your loss. I'm so sorry. And uh, we have others that continue to deal with sickness. Um, you know, Julie Maynard was in a very serious automobile accident, uh, but was spared and had no broken bones and just kind of banged up. But uh, her life was preserved, and we thank God for that. And uh, others that have lost loved ones. Uh, so. It's, it's been a difficult week for many in many ways, but we are grateful for God's care and, and uh, presence in our lives. On our darkest days, He's there with us, and that's a wonderful thing. Glad that you're here today. We are continuing our series on Back to Basics. <clears throat> today, we're going to talk about our moral code for living. The last couple of weeks, we've been studying from Romans chapter 1 about how that when people are devoid of God in their life, when they don't believe there is a God, they're atheistic, or at best agnostic, where they don't know, there's no evidence one way or the other that they can come to a conclusion. They're just not sure. But if you don't have God in the picture, what happens to the moral fiber or the moral climate of any community? If God is, is out of the picture, then what? It always happens. What is it? Make up your own rules. Chaos can develop. Is it, is it going to be a society without God in it? Is it going to be a moral society, an upright, a safe, crime-free, honest? It, it automatically degrades. So that as God is further and further removed from society or it removed completely, then there is going to be what fill the void? What takes the place of God? If God's out of the picture, who do you think is coming in? Say, the devil is going to come in. He's going to wreak havoc. And we have uh, talked quite a bit lately of the changes that we've all seen in our lifetimes, of the ways in which our society has slipped away from God, and it has caused problems. So <clears throat> we want to talk today about our moral code, our moral fiber, um, and what is it that makes us tick? What makes it our character? Uh, and is that something that is rock solid? Or is that something that we need to be concerned about because there's a, a lot of questioning, a lot of things going on to where people don't know right from wrong anymore. People are not certain if this is right, all the way, always right, or this is wrong, always wrong. So what are some things, other than what we've already talked about, what are some areas that you're concerned with uh, in regard to morality in our climate today? Okay, lack of respect. And, and that mindset permeates every factor of, of life. For instance, uh, as a teacher and a coach years ago, I saw it slipping away quickly. Um, I was talking with someone at work the other day when I was a kid growing up, corporal punishment was alive and well in our school. If you misbehaved and you did something wrong, you went to the principal's office and you got a paddling. Now, it wasn't abusive, it wasn't uh, where, it, but it got your attention. And uh, it was something that, it was actually, it was even prevalent in our community. Uh, if you were at somebody else's house, you would be, I mean, you might not be spanked, but you might get a spanking or you might get a, a good chewing from somebody else's mama if you were not doing what you're supposed to be doing. That everybody had the same sense of morality and, and the same sense of discipline. And if you misbehave, somebody's gonna call you on it, no matter where you were at, whose house you were at. There was a, a, a line in the sand. There's, do you do this, that's wrong, and you're gonna get in trouble, okay? And 
when we have people that have lost that sense of respect for authority in whatever level that at, um, I, I, I saw it in a lack of respect for parents, where parents don't demand respect from their kids. And if you don't respect your parents, who are you going to respect? Nobody. Okay? Um, Jonathan, you seen a lack of respect in ball? No. No, see, it's the only thing left. It's the only thing left. Uh, yeah. He's got some built in. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and what happens when a, a, a kid uh, rebels and he's disciplined on, on the field or on the court? What happens? Mom and dad are going to be waiting. They'll be ready to roll. We're going to go at it. Right? When I was a kid growing up, my dad told me many times, you do wrong at school, you're going to get it when you get home. My dad said, this country is founded on the principle that you're innocent until proven guilty. I live by the principle you're guilty until you can prove you're innocent. So when an adult says you did something, guess what? You did it unless you can prove to me otherwise. And you're going to pay a price. But, but we see that. We see it um, in the classroom, teachers. We see rebellion in the classroom, disrespect in the classroom. How's it manifested? Smart mouth, refusing to do what you're told to do, thinking that they're justified and not wanting to do what you're asking them to do or telling them to do, that type of thing. <clears throat> All right? We see it in our, our society with responding to the police. Now, is that to say that there are some police officers that have done wrong? Yes. There are police officers that need to be held accountable for their actions. Does that mean that because this person did something wrong that we have disdain for all law enforcement? No. There are wonderful men and women who put their lives on the line every day to protect us and to save us and to help us. And they need our utmost in respect and support. And yet there are people that if they wear a uniform, the people despise them, say ugly things to them, do mean things to them, and try to be belligerent to see if they can get something out of them, get them started. So all that takes place. We have a lack of respect for any type of authority from God. The people don't believe that God, uh, they don't believe in God, so I'm not going to do anything that he says. I'm not going to live my life in any way uh, living under somebody else's code of ethics. Okay. So our class today, we begin in Galatians chapter 5, if you have a Bible handy, beginning with verse 16. We have this uh, dichotomy between life in the spirit and life in the flesh. Uh, it's been this way. It will be this way. Uh, so if someone knows that we're a Christian, they should know a certain standard by which we live and how we ought to behave, how we ought to treat people, and how we choose to live our lives. Now, we're all individuals, and we, we have different personalities, and we do things differently, but overall, should people be able to trust us as Christians to a certain standard of moral conduct? Yes, and... Not to say that we're perfect, not to say that we haven't messed that up, but what if we mess it up? We own it. We're accountable for it. We confess it. We make it right. We repent of it. And we, we strive not to do it again. Whereas the world, if the world does something that's wrong, they say it's none of your business. They'll justify it. They'll rationalize it. And they'll hold on to it. Uh, and they get very defensive if anybody says otherwise. So this... This quest between life in the spirit and life in the flesh is depicted in Galatians 5. Beginning with verse 16 says, So I say, live by the spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you, not, you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Okay? So there is a tug of war at play between life in the spirit and life of the flesh. Paul calls it natural man. Natural man is someone devoid of God in their life. And then we have the spirit-led person. Uh, and they're at war with one another. Uh, and Paul says that they're in conflict and that sometimes when the natural man gets a hold of us, 
uh, and we fail to the flesh, then we do things that we really don't want to do. Have you ever done something you never wanted really to do? You succumb to temptation? Yeah. All right. So he says, the acts of the sinful nature. What? Yeah, it's that growth, the, the seed, which is the Word of God growing in us. And it does, it's just like a, a, a plant. It, once it takes up root, it continues to grow and to prosper and to bloom. We open ourselves up to the Spirit and allow, now allow the sinful man to quench the Spirit. That absolutely takes place. He says, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Now that's quite a list. Now out of that list, there are some things in there that you've never done. Hope, oh, maybe, right? Don't wanna talk about it? Okay. So there's some things on there that that you haven't had, had any part of, but before you get too prideful about that, what about the rest of the list? Envy, factions, divisions, strife. You ever had any problems with that? Selfish ambition. So there are a few things in there that are things that you've dealt with in the past in your life. Okay? And so what Paul's wanting us to see is that we all need to embrace the fact that we have to deal with life in the flesh and that we are not perfect at it and that we fail as people of the flesh sometimes. There are some acts of the flesh that you have a predisposition for. Meaning that that's your struggle. Uh, the writer of Hebrews says, let us lay aside every weight and the, the sin that does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So the writer of Hebrews says that basically each of us have some particular sin we struggle with. It may not be the same one that I have that you have and vice versa, but we all have something that is our Achilles. And it's, it's what is grabbing onto us in the flesh. So what should we do about that? Have you ever heard somebody say, yeah, I'm, and you could fill in the blank with whatever it is. I've heard people say, yeah, I got a little problem with anger. Yeah, I admit that, but you know what? Yeah, it's just me. Deal with it. But life in the Spirit says what to rage? Fits of wrath and anger. What does the life of the Spirit say to that? What is the Spirit speaking to in line with rage and fits of anger? Okay, withdraw from it. Get closer to God. What else? Yeah. And so what happens too is that the Spirit will make us aware of those things. Do you ever get, um, you've done something and immediately when you've done it, you get this feeling like, oh, I, you know what, I should not have said that. Should not have done that. Right, And so when we have those moments, when we are realizing that the flesh has uh, gravitated toward, we've gravitated toward the flesh and something has been manifested that is not of the Spirit, then we need to be reminded of it and get our attention brought to it and make adjustments. So how do you make adjustments to that? Let's just say anger. How do we adjust to anger in the Spirit? Quit having kids. <laughs> yes, that cer certainly can contribute to it. Pray about it. Pray about it. Ask God to assist you in overcoming it. But acknowledge it and be sorrowful for it. I'm so sorry. I should not have done that. I, I apologize to whoever has been offended by it or has had to deal the brunt of it. And then ask God for his help and forgiveness too so that we can overcome it. It's the desire to overcome it that's so important. 
that when we, we fail, we acknowledge that we fail. We don't, and that's really, that's the nook and cranny of this thing. That's where the rubber meets the road. We live in a society that doesn't want to own their mistakes and shortcomings and failures. They want to do what with it? Blame somebody else, not my fault, or justify it, or rationalize it away, Mary. Oh, he will use it, won't he? You're so unaware because you thought you were so strong in that. I often use this illustration that Satan has a tackle box with our lure in it. And he knows where we're vulnerable and where we could struggle. And that's what he attacks with. That's what he goes after. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, the acts of sinful nature are obvious. And he lists them. And he says, but the fruit of the Spirit, in verse 22, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Okay, we're going to come back to that last verse in just a minute. Okay, so someone who is filled with the Spirit, somebody who is oozing that of godliness in their life, it's manifested by character, love, patience, and all of these other um, uh, attributes. Uh, and so... My question to all of us today is, as you look through that list, is it permeating your life? Could someone who knows you say that you're a person of love? Are you a person of joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, and all of these things? And we would acknowledge that from time to time that we need to do better at some of these attributes, some of these virtues. Okay? So, again... We, we saw how if we're failing in the, in the life in the flesh, and we, we see that there are things that we need to grow in the Spirit, we need to do the same thing. If we know that I'm not as patient as I need to be, then we need to pray to God for patience. God, give me greater patience. God, help me in that area. And develop a game plan of how I'm going to work on gaining the control over that in my life. Okay? Um, so if you know that you're an impatient person, how can you overcome that with God's help? What is, you do, do you need to develop a strategy? Yeah, develop a strategy. Uh, whatever it is, whatever sinfulness is, is a part of your life. Many, many years ago when I was a youth minister, I was talking with a, one of our teenage couples who was having problems they were really in love with each other and were becoming very passionate. And they had crossed the line with each other and they'd done some things they shouldn't have done as being unmarried single people. And they were wanting my help and my um, guidance in those areas. So I said to them, when do you feel the most pressure to, to have sex with one another? When is it that you feel vulnerable when you realize that you're in danger of doing something you shouldn't be doing as people who are not married? And they said, usually it's like late at night uh, when we're alone and like we'll go, you know, we'll go somewhere to be alone or we'll park somewhere off by ourselves and that's when we start talking and then we start kissing and then things start happening. I said, okay. So you already acknowledge that, that you have gone down the road too far and you've done too much and you want to stop it. That's wonderful. That's awesome. So how are we going to... Well, first of all, we ask God for forgiveness. God, forgive us of the things that we've done that we know that we're too far. We've, we've crossed the line with you. But we desire purity. We desire to be whole. We desire to please you. So we ask God to help us with that. Okay. Now, you can ask God for help in all that, but if you don't have a plan that is led by God to help you with that, what's going to happen? You can say, God, please forgive me. Help us not do that again. And then the next time you go out on a date, what? If you don't have a plan... 
You get back in the same old rut, go down the same highway, you get down the same road to the same parking lot, to the same place, the next thing you know you're talking again, the next thing you know you're kissing again, the next thing you know, uh-oh. All right? So you develop a plan. When they spoke these words to me, I said, okay, you're vulnerable first of all when what? Did anybody hear the first thing they said when they were vulnerable? When we're alone. When it's just the two of us. I said, well, what you need to do is you need to double date. Find another Christian couple to go out with. Don't be alone. Uh, or do something where there's a lot of people around. Date when out in public, not in private. Okay, you get in trouble when you drive somewhere to be alone. Don't drive somewhere to be alone. Don't go into the parking lot in back dark corner somewhere by yourself. That's a no-no. That'll get you in trouble. Okay? Um, and if you need to be affectionate with one another, you can be affectionate somewhere in a public way, in a public sense of propriety. If you want to give them a kiss, give them a kiss. But you don't have to be in a secluded place where you're going to start making out and things happen after that. So you develop a plan. Same thing is true with whatever it is in your life. Okay? Let's say that you have a problem with road rage. Right? Will road rage get you in trouble? Will road rage put you in a situation where you're not bringing honor and glory to God? Yeah. So what do you do about it? You know, I find myself, I do this sometimes. Have you ever been going somewhere and you're really, you're running on time, you're not even behind time, you're not even in a real hurry, but you still find yourself driving like a crazy person? That ever happened to you? I mean, you have no rush. You're going to be there early, but you still. This happened to us last night. We as a family were driving along, and all of a sudden the light changed. Three out of the four people in the car said, go, go, go. <laughs> there was no schedule. We were not late. This was not an emergency to the hospital. And so I stopped the car at the lot. Three out of the four people in the car said, we could have made it. <laughs> I will not name any of the names of any occupants, not to say whether they were family or friends or associates or just people that were hitchhiking that I picked up. Don't know. <laughs> not going to say that. All right? But I have found myself that a lot of times I am running, I'm wrong, get on through that light. I look down the speedometer, I'm going way too fast for that. I'm like, what am I doing? I'm not even in a hurry. But I've got to get there, right? So back out, back off. Leave a little early if you need to. Uh, turn on some nice music that is soothing. Just chill, just relax and enjoy the moment. You are not in the Indy 500. This is not the Daytona 500. We are not going to bump cars and gain position. The, the other day... The other day, it was pouring down rain. I was headed to Nashville to work during rush hour traffic in a downpour. And we're all driving under the speed limit, probably 60 miles an hour. There's places where they're almost hydroplaning at the bottoms of the roads and stuff. And all of a sudden, I see this car. Zoo, zoo, zoo. You ever played Frogger? This car was like Frogger. Zing and zing, in and out, in and out. And, and I look, and it flies by me, and it's a Mini Cooper. And it's doing probably 90 miles an hour. And I'm like, wow. That's crazy. So develop a plan, whatever it is. You know what? I don't want to be a person filled with rage. I don't need to lay down on the horn every time somebody violates my spacing. I should not be flipping them certain fingers on my hands. Right? Um... Be someone who wants to be full of the Spirit, oozing Spirit, so that people will acknowledge in all the totality of my life that I'm striving to be like Christ. Okay? Um, he says, those who belong to Christ Jesus in verse 24 have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. What is that, what is that imagery? If you have crucified something in your life, then what? The imaging, first of all, let's just take crucify. When, when the Bible says that you need to crucify something, is that an easy process? Is that a painful process? What about crucifixion? Put it to death? 
It's for keeps, but is it easy? No. No, it's not easy. And you may have failed from time to time. But when we crucify the desires of the flesh, it's, it's a process that brings about death because we want it over with. We want it to end. And we're going to follow through with it. Whatever pain it causes me, I want it out of my life. I want it behind me. Okay? And so he brings it home because it's obvious that in most of the churches that he writes to, there's some problems. In fact, the only church that he writes to that he doesn't indict them in some way for difficulties that they're struggling with is Philippi. Everybody else, he's got things to say about them that need to repent of. But listen to this in Galatians 5 and verse 26. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying one another. Okay? Three things. Don't be conceited. What is conceited? Thinking more highly than you ought to. Um, cocky. Uh, full of pride. Thinking you somebody. Your perspective is you're looking down at other people. Those are all great descriptions. So we shouldn't be full of pride, ego, those types of things. We've got to get rid of it. Don't become conceited. Don't provoke somebody. We have trouble in our home with the kids provoking each other. Your kids provoke one another? Did they? Automatically doing something they knew was going to cause a problem. All right? Are there things that people say and do willingly and knowingly aware that that's going to be a problem? And then finally, envying one another. So why is the root of that? Why is there that we would ever, as brothers and sisters in Christ, be full of conceit, provoke each other, and uh, be at enmity with one another? What is the root of all that? Self-centeredness. Selfishness. The, the most important person in my life is who? Me. Have you ever met somebody that it's all about them? Um, doesn't matter what you do, it's their desire. Um, and so what happens is, when we bring together the body of believers, if we have people in the church that are full of themselves, they're cocky, they're prideful, they look down at others, um, and they provoke people, and they're envious of one another, what is, what is the environment going to be like in that body? Is it something you long to be a part of? No. There are times that we have to have a time out at our house where we tell the kids, okay, silence. You're not going to say anything. You just sit there. We're going to have a moment of peace. Stop it. I don't know if you're like me. There is enough external noise and external stuff going on in my world that when I get home, I want to be in a place that's an oasis from all that. I have to deal with people in highly stressful situations every day, and there's a lot of yow yowing and carrying on that goes on. When I get home, I don't want any more of it. I'm not ready for more. I'm like, wow, that's an exciting day. Let's have some more excitement at home. Right? And so, in, we are not to be people who are trying to provoke or get something started. And so how does that permeate us together as a fellowship here? Now the cool thing is, I don't really know that much about our fellowship here. I'm just kind of learning everybody. So anything I say is totally innocent because I have no idea. Because I'll be honest with you, I don't want to listen to anybody else's baggage. Don't come and tell me about so-and-so or this person or that person. I don't need to know it. Let God deal with that. So, we get in a situation no matter what it is. Is there going to be disagreements from time to time? Okay. 
And I, I want to tell you something, and I know a few of them are here today, but I want to tell you something. One of the beautiful things about our eldership here is they have great hearts and they really want to do what God wants. But with that still being said, they realize that you can make decisions and people can disagree and say, well, that's not right, or I don't go along with that, or I don't like that, right? And it could be any number of things, okay? Are there things that they've had to decide over the last year or the last few weeks or the last few months that is controversial? Yeah. Um, and you can name any one of them. Mask policies, service policies, times, going back again on the second to one service, any number of things. So what should be our spirit anytime we come together? Whether it's something the elders decided or it's just the spirit of the body of Christ here, what should be our spirit and our attitude when we come together? Unity. And unity is more important than my philosophy or my preferences. I don't have to have my way. If it's all about my way and I'm going to throw a hissy fit if I don't get my way, that's causing, provoking, and problems in the body. Is it okay to voice a, a different opinion about something? Yes, but how? In love. You just say, hey, I've been concerned. I understand we're going to do this, but I've got concerns. I just want to share it with you. And they'll be accepted in the spirit of love, but we share that. And we just say, but whatever's decided or whatever we need to do, I'm going to support you and we're going to go along with it and it's going to be great. That's the spirit of Christ. I don't know if I've told you this. You know, I've spoken to so many different audiences and so many different venues. I don't remember who I tell stuff to. I should take notes about that. But anyway, um, years ago when I was first starting in ministry, I was an intern, a youth minister outside of St. Louis. And I saw a, a physical fight over what kind of van we were going to buy for the church. I'd never been to a men's business meeting until that day. I was, I was 19 years old. It was my first men's business meeting. Satan does some good work in business meetings sometimes. The item up on the agenda came up of what kind of van do y'all want? We need a church van. Some people were adamant that we need to have a Chevy. Some folks were adamant we needed to have a Ford. And the debate came down to a Ford or a Chevy. And these two guys were sitting right behind each other, and they got into an argument. They stood up, and they actually physically started hitting and shoving each other and smacking one another. A couple guys had to jump up and go over and get in between them and separate them. So we bought a Dodge. And it was awful. <clears throat> But I'm here to say this. Satan sees that, hears that, witnesses that. What's his reaction? You got godly, supposed to be Christians, men of God. They're physically having a fist fight over a brand of a vehicle. What is his reaction? They're high fiving if there was such a thing back in that day, right? They're excited. The demons and the devils and all them, they're excited because we got Christians battling one another. And what's going on in heaven? The shaking hell. No, 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 no. And so what I want each of us to do in this next week, and we'll pick up from here, we're going to go back into Romans next week, but I want you to think about how God is calling to you to a deeper level of relationship with you. And what are the things in your life that God is speaking to you about wanting you to change? You're getting this discernment. There are some things that need to be different about me. Some things I need to grow in. Some things I need to stop. Some things I need to start. Those things. Because the problem in the world is, is that people of the world and of the flesh, they don't think they have a problem. They don't think there's anything wrong with them. They like themselves just the way they are. You're the one that has the problem. But what we need to sense is that God is always drawing us to a deeper relationship with Him. And no matter how long we live, will we ever fully arrive mature in Christ? Will we ever get to a place where God says, I'm done, you're as good as He gets? No. He's still working. He is still working. 
And so what we want to do is to humbly say to ourselves, with all the things that are going on in our society today, it's all so easy to nitpick other people's lives and always say what other people should be doing or how things are wrong in this and wrong in that. But we need to look through the perfect law of liberty into our own lives to say what? What does God say to me? What do I need to take note of? What areas in my life need changing? And move toward that so that God is more pleased. Kind of a shortage of that in our society today. Patience. Need it now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that your word challenges us to be separate from the world, to live a life guided by the Spirit and not of the flesh. And we acknowledge to you, God, that there are times in this walk that we fail you. The works of the flesh are sometimes manifested in us. And that we're all capable of slipping away into that life. But it's not what we want. It's not what we desire. And we know that it's not what your will is for our life. So help us, Father, to be cognizant of the areas in which uh, we need to grow in spiritually. And we pray for your help in those areas. And we pray for humility that we might repent and that we might be accountable for the things that are amiss in our life. For more than anything else, our Father, we want you to look down with on us through Jesus and see us as your children, redeemed and justified by the blood and set apart for a greater purpose. And help us to that end. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being here this morning.